Well, good evening. Um, my name is Katayun Chamani, and I'm an associate professor here of biology at the New School. And I want to welcome everyone to our event this evening, Revisiting the AIDS Crisis and the Ongoing Epidemic. Um, some of you might not be aware, but this is part of a three-day series of events that comes under a different rubric called uh, Public Health Challenges for the 21st Century, the Global and National Landscape. This public programming series is by its very development, centered on collaboration with community organizations, students, faculty, academic programs here at the New School. And we welcome suggestions from the general public as well as students on campus. So if there are events or ideas for events in the future, we would be happy to take those ideas as you leave this evening. Um, those events take place throughout the academic year and they're open and free to the public like this one is this evening. This particular event could not have been done without a long list of sponsors, so I'm going to make sure I thank everyone who contributed to this effort. Um, the Department of Natural Sciences and Math from Eugene Lang College at the New School for Liberal Arts, that's my department. Um, other academic programs such as Global Studies, Thematic Interdisciplinary Programs, um, the student um, organizations that are on campus that include, um, there's a long list here, I'm trying to organize it. Uh, uh, so let's see, I'm gonna say the Office of Student Development and Activity because that is a big contributor to tonight's events. We, without their funding, we could not have sponsored this event. Uh, community organizations such as Visual Aids, um, other academic programs such as the New School for Public Engagement, the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies at CUNY Graduate Center, um, the Civic Engagement in the Office of the Dean at Parsons, uh, where Tony Whitfield is uh, the Associate Dean. And uh, Wellness and Health Promotion, which is part of our Student Health Services. And I want to give a special shout out to Tamara Oyola Santiago, without whom we could not have organized this event. She's a health educator here on campus. Um, coming Out in the Developing World, which is a student organization. Um, the social justice initiatives through our provost office, so you can see that the new school really uh, is very behind this event. We have lots of different sponsors. Um, and the last thing I want to say is you have programs in front of you. If you happen to walk in and did not get a program, I would really want to ask you to ask for one, and I'll be happy to bring one to you. Um, these events, we really want to make sure people feel that they can do lifelong learning afterwards. So if you open up the program, you'll see a list of resources on the inside, as well as a list of courses um, that are open to the public for registration, as well as our academic programs on the back. And most importantly, we have descriptions of the two other events that are part of this three-day series. Tomorrow is Time is Not a Line, and on Monday night, we have AIDS, Treatment, and Labor, where we'll be looking at the syndemic of co-infection with HIV and tuberculosis, which is a very uh, big uh, topic these days. So without further ado, I'm going to have Tony Whitfield introduce our uh, guests this evening, and I would like to ask everyone to turn off their phones. Please silence them. This is being video streamed. We are also going to be passing out index cards. We would like you to write your questions down so that we can be somewhat democratic about the Q&A after the directors have their conversation with Tony. Okay, thanks Katayun. Um, as she said, I'm Tony Whitfield and I am the Associate Dean for Civic Engagement here at Parsons. And I am, um, actually I wrote this out, which I usually don't do, because, but I felt like tonight I really needed to. Um, and I just want to say essentially that I'm honored to act as a facilitator for what I believe is an historic dialogue, because I really do, um, between two filmmakers whose work in taking on the formidable um, task of bringing to us a cogent vision of what we, as sponsors, agreed in one of the most is one of the most complex, critically important social movements to happen in this country in the last 50 years. Um, yet that movement for most Americans remains unknown. I've actually it's been made clear to me over and over again whenever any of these, I talk to any of my students about these films, it, um, and also to straight friends who actually have been seeing both of them. Um, the question is, I, the response is often, I didn't know anything about this, or where was I? Um, in any case, for, um, over the course of the last year, the work of David France and Jim Hubbard um, and dozens of individuals who've worked with them um, has provided invaluable entry into that material. 
Um, I'll introduce each filmmaker and ask them to join me on stage. Jim Hubbard um, is the director and co-producer with Sarah Schulman. Hello, Sarah. How are you? I saw you. Um, of United in Anger, a feature-length documentary on ACT UP, the AIDS activist group. Jim has been making films since 1974. In collaboration with Sarah, he continues to expand the ACT UP oral history project as well, um, as well, which has been installed in a 14 monitor installation at the Carpenter Center for the Arts at Harvard University as part of an, uh, the exhibition ACT UP New York Activism, Art, and the AIDS Crisis, 1987 to 1993. Other versions of this project have been shown at White Columns. Um, uh, this project has also been adapted into a nine-part cable, cable television series. Among his 19 other films are, and Jim told me that this was very long, but I do feel like I do need to read these. Elegy in the Street, um, 1989, Two Marches, 1991, The Dance, 1992, Memento Mori, 1995. His films have been shown at the Museum of Modern Art, the Berlin Film Festival, the London Film Festival, the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, the New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Tokyo, London, um, and fe festivals in, and many other lesbian and gay film festivals. His film Memento Mori won the Ursula for Best uh, Short Film at the Hamburg Lesbian and Gay Film Festival in 1995. Jim was also the co-founder of MIX, the New York Lesbian and Gay Experiment, ex Experimental Film um, Festival, and as a, former, um, as a former board president of the new festival, um, I'm really glad that that was around because the new festival had certainly it covered one side of the street and there was a whole lot of other work that Jim actually took on, so thanks Jim for that. Um, under the auspices of the uh, Estate Project for Artists with AIDS, he created the AIDS Activist Video Collection at the New York Public Library. He curated the series Fever in the Archive, AIDS Activist Videotapes from um, the Royal St. Mark's Collection for the Guggenheim. Um, the eight program series took place in, in December of 2000. He also co-curated the series Another Wave, Recent Global uh, queer Cinema at the Museum of Modern Art um, in July and September of 2006. Jim, you want to come down? <laughs> and David, why don't you come on down? To, come on down. Um, David France is the director and co-producer of How to Survive a Plague, a feature-length film on AIDS activism and the impact of AIDS on tr uh, and its impact on AIDS treatment. A former Newsweek senior editor, David is a contributing editor to New York Magazine. His work has been published in GQ, the New York Times Magazine, the New Yorker, Vanity Fair, and Rolling Stone. He has written three books, including Our Fathers, an acclaimed investigation of the Catholic Church of Catholic Church sexual abuse, um, sexual abuse, and the New York Times bestseller, The Confession with Governor James E. McGreevy, um, as well as Bag of Toys. I don't know why you left that off this list. <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> um, several films have been inspired by his work, including um, Thanks uh, of a Grateful Nation, a controversial Showtime miniseries about the first Gulf War, and the Peabody Award winner Soldier's Girl about a private's murder. Our Father's a, sh um, a Showtime ap adaptation of his book was nominated for Emmys and Writers Guild of America Awards. A graduate of Kalamazoo College, France now lives in New York and New Kingston, New York. How to Survive a Plague, his first effort as a director, is the recipient of a New York Film uh, Critics Circle Award for Best First Feature, the IFP Award for Best Documentary, and the nominee for many prestigious awards, including an Independent Spirit 
and the Academy Award for Best Feature Length Documentary. Um, again, what I want to remind you is that um, tonight's conversation is of international interest. Uh, there are people from all over the place watching this conversation and in rooms here and there through live streams. Um, and to take advantage of this audience, um, tonight we will ask for questions in two ways. The cards, that which you've already talked about, and we'll also be taking questions from Twitter. So use the hashtag ongoingaids, okay, to send in your, <coughs> your, your questions. Um, I am going to move away from this podium and join you over here. In thinking about this evening, I was, I recalled um, when I first met the two of you, and it was in 1984, before David and I embarked on a, a rocky relationship that went on for about a year and a half. And Jim, at the time, this is, I think, really important information to have. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go back there. I, yeah. All right. All right. Well, it came to its own end, clearly. But, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but Jim, now here's the, here's the, here's the interesting part. Um, Jim was David's roommate at the time. And it's kind of, it's out of, it's probably a little known fact at this point that you know, their dialogues around this, these issues have gone on for decades. And that this is not, these are not projects that actually kind of came to be without one knowing of the other's project. And in fact, um, as I remember, there was a moment, you can join in here, where in fact the two of you actually tried to determine whether or not you could do one film. Was that true? Yeah, we, um, we, we talked about it, we but I think it was clear from, pr from pretty early on that we were making different films and needed to make two separate films. Okay, so, and we'll come back to that because I, wanna, I think that that will begin to tell how the films developed. You know, one of the other things that was really clear to me was that when we met in 1984, um, we were really young, some younger than others. I wasn't so young. Well, in any case, um, David was the youngest. I was the young one. I'm still the youngest up here, so. Okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, we were doing things that people do. We had come to New York to be gay, to figure out what it meant to be gay, to actually make careers for ourselves, to determine whether we could actually make it in New York. Um, and Jim had, you know, had been making films since 74, as I said, um, but was working at the time as a, we were all working in jobs that no longer exist. Jim was a, a, a freelance word processor. Who knows what that means anymore. <laughs> David was a typesetter for Mandate, Honcho, and Play. Oh my God, turn that camera off. <laughs> And I was actually, I was like working in the middle of the night in some law firm proofreading, and I was terrible as a proofreader. I was really not very good. But, you know, in the years that passed before 1987, when these two movies start, a lot of things happened. And including our personal lives, which took David to Nicaragua after being a, a writer at um, the New York Native. Does anyone remember the New York Native in the room? Okay. Um, what? To Closer mouth. to my mouth? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, in any case, um, yeah, so he was at the New York Native. And then went off to Nicaragua to be a war reporter to, get, to work on the Butch profile of David France as a journalist. I don't know. Um, and then, and Jim was doing what he was doing. So then, but the deaths kept happening and they kept building. And David had been at the Native when covering some of this in the beginning. By 1987, do you want to talk about where, where the two of you were and how you actually sort of entered into, um, 
into the context of ACT UP, which is really kind of at the center of, which is at the center of both of your movies now, 25 years later? Uh, sure. Um, I had just come back from Nicaragua. I came back in 86, uh, Nicaragua and El Salvador. And, um, uh, and I took a lover who was sick. Um, uh, Doug Gould, uh, it was for him that I've dedicated How to Survive a Plague. And he came to live with us um, on East 7th Street in the East Village. And, um, and it was a time where, uh, as many of you remember, there, there was nothing you could take. There were no pills you could take. Uh, AZT in 86 hadn't even come out. And when it did come out in early 87, it became clear almost immediately that it was, that it was not going to solve our problems. And, um, and I started going to the ACT UP meetings um, looking for answers, you know, looking for um, people who might know what was happening in the drug development world. Um, it, it was a place where information was exchanged. It was life-saving information was exchanged. And, uh, and I started bringing Doug to those meetings. Um, and um, uh, at the time, I began reporting for New York Newsday. I was their uh, AIDS science news um, uh, reporter. And so I would use, I would go to those meetings and listen intently to the people, many of whom um, are the, make up the spine of the story that I tell in How to Survive a Plague, about what they were learning about how drugs are developed, what they were learning about who's doing what, um, about drug and uh, trial enrollments. Um, uh, mostly, f it was a personal mission for me to try to find information for Doug. Um, but I, I was using all the, all that, information and reporting it in Newsday as a way to let other people have access to that information. And so that, that's what brought me there and that's what kept me there. What about you, Jim? Um, well, I started, um, I was an experimental filmmaker and I started uh, filming the lesbian and gay movement in 1978 or so. And um, so when um, AIDS erupted in 81 or 82, I, I, I wanted to make a film about it in you know, some way respond to the epidemic. But I, I didn't want to do what the mainstream media was doing, which was barging into hospital rooms, showing people in their most vulnerable, vulnerable state, um, often showing people backlit because it was so shameful not only to be homosexual, but to, um, to have this, this awful disease. Um, I, I wanted to show some other you know, way of looking at it. Um, and it, that was really difficult because I, I mean, I started filming a friend of mine who had AIDS and, and you know, like after two days he said, I, you know, I don't want this camera in my face. Um, and two things happened. One is my ex-lover, um, Roger Jacoby, who was also a filmmaker, uh, was diagnosed in August of 1984 and he wanted to be filmed. So I filmed him for the rest of his life. And when he died in November of 85, I inherited his outtakes. So I had you know, a, a reasonable body of work documenting his life. And then the, the next thing that happened was in um, March of 1987, ACT UP suddenly appeared. And um, so you know, I said, I, I know how to film demonstrations. I've been doing it for 10 years now. So, um, the, I started filming ACT UP in June of 1987 and continued for years. And, and, and those two elements, Roger and ACT UP, formed the, the basis of my film Elegy in the Streets, which as a, an attempt to find a filmic equivalent for the elegiac um, form, which um, takes the death of someone close to the poet and uses it to make a larger political statement. And that's what I did in Elegy in the Street. So that was my introduction to ACT UP. And I start, started going to meetings and went to every meeting, um, you know, every Monday night for, for years after that. And you were filming through most of it? Or what was your? your yeah, I, I was filming. I filmed lots of demonstrations. But you know, there, um, the interesting thing is that I was filming on 16 millimeter and processing the film myself. <laughs> so I played around with the color and, and used it expressionistically 
you know, rather than naturalistically. So it's, it was very different from the work of the AIDS activist um, video makers whose, whose work actually made United in Anger possible. So there are only about half a dozen of my shots in United in Anger, and the vast majority of that um, footage is the video footage of, of, you know, like 30 to 40 different people. Um, both of you actually, one of the things that actually struck me, particularly since here we are in, an, in a design school at this point, is, is just, is the technology part of this? And while I don't want to dwell on it, it's important to sort of understand that it was a very different world. That in fact the equipment you were using was changing on a very, very rapidly. Um, how you used it, what in fact its capabilities were, had to be taught, learned really quickly, and it actually shows in both of your in both of your films that um, the material you're working with changes over over the period of time. You want to talk a little bit about about that and how it in fact had you know, an impact, if at all, on the shape of your film and what, you know, what, what you decided you could or could not do? Um, well, in, in 1987, uh, when, uh, when uh, ACT UP started, the, uh, the, the basic camera for filming news events and for, you know, was, was the three-quarter inch camera and, or what, since we're live streaming, what everyone else in the world calls umatic, um, and you know there was a it was a camera about this big, and originally actually it came with an, a VTR, a suitcase with it. So uh, and usually had a um, a a boom mic. So so it took two or three people to do this. And um, in fact, although the most of the act up footage, say from testing the limits or when Jean Carlo Musto was um, filming for GMHC was was done with um, two people, and um, then in 1988, Video 8 came out. So suddenly there was a relatively small, well, actually really small, um, camera that was a relatively high quality that you could run around and tape demonstrations, and and that really made the AIDS activist video movement possible. Uh, and most of the footage in both our films, I mean, some of it's three quarter, uh, most of it is video eight, and then it's, uh, there's also VHS in it. So, and I, I don't know how it impacted on the design. I think I, um, in the editing, I, I should shout out Ali Cotterill, my editor, who's sitting in the back there. And, um, we, we edited, a, you know, it was, we ignored the, the original uh, format and just dealt with, with the content of the, of the shot. David, what, did, did that have an impact for you? Uh, well, uh, well, I decided, much as Jim did, although we, we didn't talk about our creative work as we were doing this, um, uh, to to use that old footage, I didn't shoot any of it. I, I went back to um, the cinematographers working at the time and, and asked to be able to use their footage. Um, and I decided I wanted to use all that footage as, as you know, A roll, not B roll, that it was not gonna be in the background to, to talking heads. Um, and as Jim pointed out, it was, it was uh, multiple formats, but it was also you know, formats within those formats. And um, for us, the big challenge was finding you know, once we found the tapes, was finding um, the decks that we could use to digitize them. And we spent a lot of time on, on um, Craigslist and eBay uh, advertising our needs to find, you know, decks that we were able to find both audio and, and, and video on, you know, on these tapes. And, uh, and for some of them, the, it was a real challenge. And uh, ultimately, we took many tapes to many uh, transfer houses trying to find people who who could find what we knew was on those cassettes and um, uh, but ultimately we you know it's such a beautiful look that kind of old video that that kind of saturated 1980s uh, VHS look and um, and and we just decided that it was gorgeous and we were going to work with it as gorgeous footage and not apologize it uh, apologize for the for the quality or the color or the way that the um, 
the, the way that those images look now, 25 and almost 30 years later. Well, I guess there's one thing I, want, I do want to add, because um, it, it, um, my film is in 4-3. Um, you know, it's 4 by 3. It's a square, like you know, old television sets. And that was really important, because um, I wanted to um, retain the integrity of the original footage, which is all 4-3. And I, I didn't do that. So, so I, I blew it up, which means that there are parts of the, the images that were shot and retained that have been cut off in order f for it to be widescreen um, you know, cinema. And that, I felt, was important for mixing it with the on-camera interviews that I did do. I, wanted to, I didn't want to jar people's eyes that way. One of the reasons that I wanted to ask you about this is to actually kind of underscore early in this discussion the fact that these films exist as objects in some ways, that they're, they now sort of jo join this kind of world of artifacts that have to do with this period. But one of the things that I was struck by and just in watching the film was just remembering what the context was in which this was all being made. That not everybody would take film like this or take material like this and process it, work with people, that we, that gay people, people with AIDS at that point were pretty much pariahs. And that what it took to actually make these videotapes and make this kind of record really had to, in a lot of ways, exist outside of a lot of the normal channels. So a lot of what was happening was also um, kind of the result of the circumstance that AIDS had created for people who were also not necessary, who were not even kind of part of the mainstream to begin with. Um, and, you know, talk a little bit about how, what kind of, how, how that circumstance Where you, where you saw conveying that circumstance in your films? Because I think you, the two of you do it differently. Can you talk about what that, not, not just the technical versus the passionate and the, the emotional and the, and the human suffering part of it, but just how you actually deal with trying to tell a story that has a reality, has has so many levels of reality, and then do it in the context of an object, which an artifact. Big question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll just try. Okay. Um, we'll come back. The, uh, the, the uh, much as I was working in that time, um, finding news, finding information, telling our stories in print, the uh, the people who were doing this work in video were, were um, capturing a, a, a part of history that nobody else was really seeing. That the, um, the television news, and you, you pointed this out, Jim, television news really was um, satisfied with just images of people, uh, very sick people in hospital beds. And they would use that as a backdrop for whatever story that they were telling. And that uh, the daily papers weren't covering it much. The magazines weren't, weren't really telling our stories. Um, and so the impetus, um, uh, the, the kind of general impetus for, for all of us who were telling those stories then was to, to tell stories that no one else was seeing and that people were refusing to tell in other ways and in other places. And, um, uh, and, and, th and that led to you know, certain decisions about how those, those, that footage, uh, Jim knows this footage way better than I do, about how, um, what was included in the footage, and the footage was uh, mostly aimed at trying to show the, a, a community's response and strength and uh, agency in the in the face of this plague, um, and that's why it's so you know it has such vitality because it's 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 really the battle that was being waged you know against HIV. It's it was harder for me in my quest to find footage of uh, what. The, what the, of sick people. You know, there was a, there was a, a, a real concerted effort to, to show strength and power 
and um, and that made it um, that made it harder for me to as I was doing my search for footage to to find for a new audience the the other footage the footage of sickness the footage of uh, people in hospitals. Um, I was looking for a long time, for like three years, trying to find footage of just ordinary plague in New York, the way we remember it looked, the way uh, you would see, you know, just uh, incredibly ill, very young men on the sidewalks um, trying to hail cabs and uh, gasping for air, and um, the 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 plague was everywhere. It was it was visually everywhere, and I just never did find any of that footage. And um, and uh, and I certainly understand why it wasn't a priority for uh, people who were doing video activism at the time. Um, but I thought maybe I would find it in like news archives, and I didn't even find it there. Um, so it was there was, was kind of contrasting uh, impetuses for gathering this footage, kind of you know helped. Uh, create the limits and also the possibility for, for the stories that we told. What about you? No, it doesn't mean that doesn't exist at this moment. Um, oh. no. Well, Jim, why don't you? Um, because your, your experience is someone who is filming on a yeah, no, that's on that, an ongoing way. Right. Is, is it's in, in a way, your question seems strange to me because I lived, lived in a world, you know, I was immersed in a world of alternative media. So it seemed completely normal for me for a reaction to be you know, let, you know, let's film this, you know, th this is our, our lives and we, you know, we have to get this um, documented and recorded any way we can. So, th so, so that seemed like um, a, a very, you know, just, just the, the normal response that one would have from a media maker. Um, but there's all, you know, there's always a political um, aspect to aesthetic decisions. And the, you know, the footage that people were making was, you know, like w with Video 8, that didn't come up to broadcast standards, right? And it wouldn't, wouldn't go on TV until they needed the footage. And then, then they were begging and even paying for it. So, so the, that, there was a kind of weird bifurcated response. But, but ACT UP always had um, different media strategies. I mean, one, one of co course was, you know, in, in Ann Northrup's um, formulation, uh, we talk through the media and not to the media. So getting, getting that footage onto TV was, was kind of, was an aspect of that. But for, for me as, as an experimental filmmaker, the more important the, the truer response was to make our own media and, and, and get it out into the world. And th those AIDS activist videos, which um, seemed you know, like were utterly urgent and absolutely of the moment um, and, and needed and, and made simply to get that information out, you know, life-saving information out to people. They, it's, they, because of that immediacy, and that urgency, they retain this incredible power. And, and, and that's, I think, why, why I was able to make the, the film that I did, because, you know, because people were right there, right you know, in the midst of the demonstrations filming. I should uh, uh, take the chance, to take this opportunity to introduce at least three of the people who are here who created some of that footage. Jean Carlo Musto, who's here. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand, Jean. James Wensey and Tony Arena, who's sitting in the back. And um, it's, um, it's a great audience, actually. It's, it's just saying earlier that this is, this is historic for a lot of reasons. Can you now let's let's get to the two films that you made. You want to talk about the decisions that you made about where, what you wanted to do in the beginning and how those, how those projects evolved. Um, start with the point at which you were to, the, I'm really curious about at what happened when the two of you were working together and what it was, what, when the moment of clarity came when you understood that you wanted to do two different things and what those things were. 
how, what, how did you describe those two different things then? And did that, that in, evolve into, how did that evolve into what you actually did? Well, this was many years ago, and it's not, um, it would be overstating it to say that we worked together on a project for any period of time, but we did talk about doing it together, and we sat um, to, 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 uh, to lay out the approach to the, to the storytelling, and, um, and in fact, the difference that we had then is exactly the difference between our films now. I wanted to tell stories of a, a individual or individuals as they went through kind of a 10-year arc, um, and... Uh, Jim wanted to tell a story of an organization, and um, and that I think is those in 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 the vaguest possible terms is the difference between the approach that we took, um, and m my approach, um, and it, the story that I tell in How to Survive a Plague is a story of uh, a, a small handful of people, very thin slice through ACT UP, and then later through uh, the Treatment Action Group, um, uh, looking at the way individuals. Uh, worked to uh, contribute to the discovery and then uh, uh, br uh, bringing online the drugs that helped to make a HIV a survivable infection. And that came to fruition in 1996. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to infuse that thin story with the, with the, the weight of the larger history of, of AIDS. Um, and, and in doing that, I, you know, I, by definition, don't tell the story of ACT UP, how it came around, you know, what else it was doing, all the, all the major, major contributions that it made both in New York and around the country and around the world. So that, that um, in a way, allowed our films, and this is the way we talked about it when we first agreed to do two separate projects, it allowed them to work together as com uh, companions to tell, um, uh, you know, the, the, both the organizational uh, and, and political story about AIDS and AIDS activism, and then this this uh, kind of thin kind of human story through it. Um, and would you say that's ac an accurate way to present that? Um, yeah, you know, it's it's hard after all these years to um, remember exactly how I talked about the film in the in the beginning. But I think that I've always said that there were two main purposes for my film. One is to put ACT UP and AIDS activism in general right in the middle of mainstream US history where it rightfully belongs. And, and I wanted to tell that story from the grassroots because it just, it just th that's you know, where the real history was, the, on the ground, that the, the truth of the AIDS crisis is that the US government and the pharmaceutical industry and the bureaucracy and the, and the mainstream media were ignoring the crisis and they had to be forced to deal with the crisis by the people in the streets. And that's the story that had to be told. And the other thing <laughs> is that I wanted to inspire additional activism. And in order to do that, I felt that I had to, in, sen in a sense, make a, a blueprint for um, activism that, that people now couldn't do what, what we did back then. You couldn't just take the, the tactics and strategies of ACT UP wholesale and just plop it down into any political situation now, but you could use it as a model. You could, you could analogize and, and come up with brilliant strategies for now. And so that uh, all the different aspects of, of ACT UP had, had to be in the film because the, all those nuts and bolts are, the, you know, are, first of all, they're really fascinating to me, but they're also really important for understanding the movement and recreating a movement now. Um, and the other, th the other thing I, I want to emphasize is that the film comes out of the ACT UP Oral History Project. And um, uh, we've done 154 interviews. Number 155 is tomorrow afternoon. Um, we, <laughs> so, so, so very early on, I had the idea that I would make the sorrow and the pity or the show of <laughs> version of, of ACT UP. And I um, realized that that was not necessary, that what was necessary was a concise um, introduction to, to the period and to ACT UP. And that the, the full story is in those 155 and, and of ultimately to be 255 interviews. 
It struck me, and actually, I, I watched your film and as turned it off and turned on the television, and there was a documentary I had never seen about the civil rights movement. And one of the things that struck me kind of sort of through that lens was what you had managed to do in terms of laying out so many pieces of a really complicated organization that all of those little cells, essentially, that you laid out that were small working groups in one way or another had enormous stories behind them already. And that it hadn't really been done. You know, it hadn't been done in terms of telling um, what the story of what a social movement really would be at the end of the 20, 20th century, beginning of the 21st century. Because I think in some ways it does function as, an, as a really interesting blueprint. So. Um, yeah, I don't. You know, I don't think that is possible for the earlier movements because I don't think the footage right. exists. I don't think exactly. it doesn't exist for the civil rights movement. It doesn't exist for the feminist movement, but it does for for ACT UP, and that's and and um, you know that's why it's you know like was vitally and it, you know it was exciting to to yeah. be able to put all that material in. And it exists for ACT UP for the first time, I think, historically. Uh, you know, a HIV comes in, in the first reports in 1981, and the camcorder is first marketed in 1982. So um, it, it created the, 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 the challenge and the response, you know, the, the tools to be able to make that, that body of, of footage for historians now forever in the future to be able to go back to. On, your, on the same level, in terms of the, just looking at the tag piece of this, what struck me, is again one uh, th just how difficult it was to harness that knowledge to actually deal with the issues that were um, scientific complicated inaccessible absent an internet absent fax machines through most of that period of time it's like how was that happening? Was they, they, were there constant Xerox machines going? You know, oh, yeah, there were. Yes. <laughs> it, <laughs> people, people you know, like people who tempted Citibank would be Xerox. Larry Gottlieb, and, 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 and the fax machine actually was really important because that was next door. That was probably a great source of material. <laughs> I'm serious because how many queer people actually worked in all of those places? But yeah. the, the fax machine was, was, was a part of ACT UP strategy. People would fax stuff and just. Um, com yeah, vax apps, yeah, to just use up all the paper in the damn thing. <laughs> um, I want to talk about, and, and I'm feeling that we need to open this up very soon, but I want to put another thing on the table. David, you've actually arrived at a point which is a really interesting point in your movie, and I know that it's well enough known at this point that there's another life to how to survive the pl a plague, which is... Um, an ABC miniseries that is coming out of it. Jim, you've had a series, a cable series. ABC is a different thing. I want you, can you talk a little bit about how you, about the pitfalls. How, in fact, you avoid the Hollywood model, which has existed from To Kill a Mockingbird all the way through Avatar, of creating heroes in a situation where, in fact, hero worship is really inappropriate and wrongheaded, and how do you do that and tell the stories in a way that actually, and I know you don't know yet because you haven't done it, but where are your fears? What do you think you might do? How do you how are you going to how are you going to take this one on? Uh, yes, it's true. Um, we're developing this project with ABC for miniseries, um, and I'm excited about it. Um, I'm, I'm excited to have that audience, uh, which is an enormous yeah. audience, and to be able to convey some aspect of our uh, history to, to, to those folks in a way that I, I, I wasn't able to reach with um, the documentary, and the documentary now is going to independent lens on PBS, and that'll give it a larger audience, but th it's still limited. Um, and I, you know, I, I, the, the miniseries, 
you know, a scripted story can be powerful. Um, and, you know, ABC is the network that brought us Roots. And Roots was, um, you know, had its problems. But it also uh, informed generations of people about um, the, the arrival of African Americans to kind of the fabric of American life. And, um, uh, and that's the kind of power that I think we might uh, have at our fingertips with this ABC project. Um, so what are the pitfalls? You know, it may never happen. So, you know, it's in development. Um, and, um, and in fact, it's probably likely not to happen the way these things go. Uh, but I'm, I'm writing it and moving it forward to, in the hope that it would happen. Um, and, uh, you know, knowing that uh, it, it will be able to reach people that I wouldn't be able to reach in any other way. Um, I'm also writing a history book, um, which will also, uh, you know, reach a different audience. But I don't think anything will be as as useful to conveying the story of what the gay community did, largely the lesbian gay community, in the early days of, of AIDS when no one else was doing anything to indict the, uh, the, the political response at the time and to, um, and to tell the truth about what happened. Um, and, you know, I, I, we've had, before we agreed to this, we had long conversations with standards and practices at ABC about, um, uh, my concern that there would be parts of the story they wouldn't let us tell. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, they just told us we can't say the word fuck. Um, and I think we can tell the story without the word fuck, although not in the archival footage because <laughs> <laughs> that's full of the word fuck. Um, so uh, so that, that's the limitation they've given us and that's the limitation I've accepted. And, and who knows what's going to happen from here out. But, um, but I'm really thrilled about this, about this opportunity to, to, to really cement in the, uh, in the minds of an of a real uh, mass audience, uh, what 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 was accomplished and who accomplished it? And you said uh, in introducing it that hero worship was inappropriate, and I don't know why because I think people uh, respond to hero stories, um, and I think that I think those stories in inspire people and uh, give people power. And especially when it's when heroics are being accomplished by by people you wouldn't expect heroics to come from. Um, in this case, you know, a, a community of gay men and lesbians, entirely disenfranchised at the time, who are able to 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 really transform everything about the about science and medicine um, and American culture at the same time in this incredible epic struggle for survival. And um, and those, to me, are, are heroes, and, they, and, and I want to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we've seen, I know you have also, Jim, but um, taking the documentaries around, that, um, that people are really um, you know, charged up after they see what happened. It's a, a piece of history that we lived through that somehow became ancient history and um, forgotten by, by uh, people who are, you know, are in charge of conveying these stories. And for this, having brought it back, we find, at least I, I'm speaking for myself, audiences that just um, kind of leap to their feet. I mean, they see it as a kind of a thrilling story. And it's hard, it was hard for me initially to have people be thrilled by the story of AIDS um, because it was so tragic. But I, I see why. I see what they're responding to. They're responding to the way uh, individuals um, triumphed. And the, those stories of triumph, I think, especially when they're true, um, should be told and should be enshrined and should be remembered and passed from generation to generation. You have no argument for me on that point. Jim, what do you think? What are you thinking if you've, from your perspective? Um, are there, what are your thoughts about sort of a project, this project sort of moving into a, a very traditional narrative context? What, what would your concerns be? Um, I, you know, um, when you make a film that's a blueprint for challenging the, um, the authority and the powers that be, um, it, you can't expect that the powers that be will um, reward you or want to tell that story. And, you know, to me, the 
the story of ACT UP is the story of the group, that the, that the story was always um, a matter of a fluidity of leadership, that people, people ordinary people rising to the occasion. And the, the structure of heroism in the U.S. It, um, and in, in U.S. narrative works against that. You know, just, um, I don't think that pulling, you know, certain individuals out and um, um, enforcing this, this, um, this narrative of heroism on, onto them is, is telling the, the real story because um, everyone in ACT UP was a hero. Well, but that, I agree. I agree, and I think each one of them have narratives that are heroic narratives. Um, so the question is, can you tell them all? And, um, and well, if you try... You know, I, um, I literally tried to get every single person into United in Anger. And that, obviously that's impossible. But, but you know, that was the intention. That, that I just, you know, like, I think it's a story of, of everyone, and that, that's the story I wanted to tell. To pull back a little bit, and it goes again to how you tell the story. There's one thing, and, then, and I'm, I'm coming back to this as a kind of point just before we open this up, because I think that there are some very, there are specifics in all of, in both of your movies that are half-told stories, are, un are untold stories, unfinished stories, and if you don't know, if you're not sort of on the inside of those stories, you're not sure where the questions should be. Like a simple, it's not a simple thing. David, to, we were talking about this in the back of the room, just simply how do you dealt with the science piece of your movie? and where that fit in terms of actually telling these stories in a way that held the attention of a fairly traditionally, uh, uh, people with fairly traditional expectations of what a movie would do. Can you talk a little bit about, about that because, and why you felt that you ne it needed to be there and what, what conditions determined <coughs> what was there? Well, I wanted to tell the story of how uh, we arrived at the drugs that made the difference in 1996, the protease inhibitors and specifically Quixavan. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and to do that, it meant that I was, um, uh, I was not able to include, as you're talking, these, the, the, the rest of the tremendous you know, um, narratives from, from ACT UP and from AIDS activism generally. Um, I, you know, I, didn't, I, I didn't touch on the, this, this the history of the community's response giving care to people with HIV, um, which was revolutionary and radical at the time. I didn't talk about housing issues. I didn't talk about IV drug use. I didn't talk about women's issues. I didn't talk about the complicated and knotty issues around race when that became um, something that ACT UP uh, was addressing. Um, and I didn't tell the story of other initiatives around uh, AIDS treatment activism. Um, until the very last cut, I had um, the, 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 the parallel initiative in ACT UP that was looking at holistic uh, responses to HIV infections. And I couldn't do it justice. Um, uh, and if you, so I found that it was not successful, and I, and I took that out. And I had also a, 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 th a thread in there about um, uh, people who were um, long-term survivors and how long-term non-progressors were, were uh, identified by the community, in fact, it, uh, members of ACT UP, as uh, a suggestion to science that maybe there was something that was automatically, uh, naturally occurring in the human body that might be making a difference and that that should be studied as well. So that came out. But I also wasn't able to tell the story about the, the, um, the parallel work that was being done by Project Inform in San Francisco. And that was equally as um, involved in the very story that I tell in How to Survive a Plague, the story of treatment activism, its birth, 
And, um, and then it's accomplishments with Proteus inhibitors. And Mar M Marty Delaney, who headed that initiative on the West Coast, was a towering figure in AIDS treatment um, activism and uh, also heroic, um, although he was not at all involved in ACT UP. So there, there, is, there are so many issues, even in my little niche that I was, that I was uh, carving out, that I wasn't able to address, and that was frustrating. Um, um, uh, uh, can I answer? Yeah, sure. yeah um, you know, as much as I tried to put everything in, or really what I tried to do is put as much in as I possibly could in, in an hour and a half, um, I, I, it was really important to me that um, the film leave the impression that this is only part of the story, that, that it's not the whole thing. And um, that's one of the functions of the timeline, for instance, because one of the most uh, important aspects of ACT UP was the simultaneity of action. There was always lots of things going on. I mean, in any given week, there were three or four zaps planning for a national uh, event, planning for an international demonstration. So that the, the film gestures towards that. And, and even though it might be more satisfying to an audience to give the sense that they're, they're, this is the entire story, I think that when people see my film, they realize, oh, there's even more to it than this. I'm going to open this up now to questions. And we have some, uh, some from the audience and some Twitter questions um, as well. Do we have to Twitter the answers? No, you cannot Twitter the answers. David, where are all the women and people of color in your film? My decision um, to tell the story about AIDS treatment activism uh, and this small group uh, and their involvement with um, the NIH and the FDA and with pharma in this research uh, limited the number of people that I, whose stories I told to, to those whose stories I told. Um, two of them are, are women, two of the five or six characters are women. Um, and uh, uh, one is Garance. And the question about who was Garance and um, what she brought to it uh, can be asked about uh, just about everybody else in the film. I, I, I picked them up in 1987, and with the exception of uh, Peter Staley, whose backstory I give, um, you don't really know much about these people except what they're confronting uh, at the moment, kind of on a daily basis. Um, the Treatment and Data Committee of ACT UP, first of all, ACT UP was, was uh, especially in the early years, um, was um, predominantly white, gay male, um, a, a grouping of uh, people just trying to save their lives, um, and uh, and as as people organized into various committees, um, that became the work that they focused on. Um, the if I were to tell the story of the media committee, for example, I just saw somebody posted a picture of all the members of the media committee, and it was you know twenty five white men on the media committee. Um, <laughs> And well, you should see the picture, and um, and uh, and you'd have to agree with me about that. But what I decided to focus on was this group of people in in uh, treatment and data, the committee that was working so uh, assiduously in the area of of challenging science and and um, and and ultimately uh, forcing their way into a dialogue with scientists, and um, and those people are the people whose stories I told, and I I knew from the onset that it, was, um, uh, that it wasn't representative of the larger organization, both in background. A lot of the people in the treatment and data group came from quite privileged backgrounds. Um, uh, and they had um, some Ivy League degrees among them. And, um, and they were able to, um, maybe more than people in other committees, able to work full time for, for no pay for years to get this, uh, to, to kind of further their, their um, you know, p political work. Um, so it was a very unique group of people within that, and, um, and, and that's whose stories I, I told. Now there's, there are uh, several junctures in the film where uh, the issue of race and the issue of gender in the world of treatment is addressed, um, and both times by white gay men um, who talk about the problems with the research establishment and the problems with the inclusion in trials. And, um, and, and so I, I, and that was in, in the archival footage that they address it. And I, I let them address it uh, and let them say that this was 
in fact, a huge problem in the way science was being conducted and the way um, uh, research was being conducted, because research was an essential way to get medicine when, at a time when no medicine was, was available or approved. Um, and so it's by, by virtue of the story that I the, the carved out of it, it, uh, it created um, this, it found this cast of characters who were there on the ground. And uh, so that's the story I told. Jim, do you want to respond to that in terms of your film too? Um, no, let, why don't we have another question? We can have another question. Um, let's start with this one. It's a handful. It's a handful? Is that what you no, said? No, it's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to give a shout out to Ray Navarro. Um, we are talking here about self-representation, <laughs> history, media, and propaganda. Ray does something radical in the footage used in both of these films. The takes control, he takes control um, of his own representation with humor, grace, anger, and almost unbearable honesty. That is almost, um, that is also what all the political funerals are about. Can you talk about the way these PWAs um, represent themselves? Both of you. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure I can answer that question because I think they represented themselves and that's the important thing. That, you know, um, that, um, I, um, you know, I appropriated all this material, but, but so much of it is that self-representation. Um, so, um, so I, I, I just, um, I'm not sure I can add anything. But we can let's talk a little it bit is about, a beautiful question. about Ray. Um, he was, um, you know, and I, was, I spoke earlier about the motivations for the uh, cinematographers. Um, and I should also have introduced Zoe Leonard, who's in the back, who is also um, chronicling that time. Um, and uh, the, Ray was an artist, um, a terrific artist. And he used his art to to comment on what was happening around him and what was happening to his own life, um, including shooting himself at the very end of his life um, in a very reflective way about um, you know, what life is and, um, and what it meant to him to be confronting these challenges at, at, at 27, 26, I think. Um, and, and, he, and he did that and he left that for us. Um, and it's, I think it's only gotten more power over the years, but it was powerful even then that he was, that he was, that he was there and making his art so politically relevant and so personal um, that, uh, that he, he brought a voice to AIDS video activism um, that others hadn't yet brought. And um, so he was, he was really an essential uh, contributor to the response at that time. I, I'm going to comment here as moderator to take advantage of this. You know, one of the things that strikes me in also um, the questions that I have about, and David and you and I have been having this conversation since the first time we talked about your movie about people of color in this. And one of the things that does strike me in both of the films is how deeply ingrained the roles of, of people of color are in even the best of intentioned work. Um, that there is a role of witness and not necessarily powerful witness, not necessarily one who feels the pain and represents the pain as opposed to the one in whose hands power is seen. And it, it's, it struck me in watching both of your films that Iris de la Cruz, that Ray Navarro, that the homeless, uh, whose, whose name I don't know, there's a black homeless woman who's talking, oh, who had sure. been home, are there as witnesses to condition, as opposed to people who are agents, who have agency. And it strikes me that in your film, you, what, and it's said in yours, Jim, that 
the whole of ACT UP dredges up to the top a lot of very, very ingrained problems, be it homelessness, race, sexism, all of that stuff. And this will lead to the next question in some ways. Is it true or false that activist footage of ACT UP um, public events are now licensed or otherwise now restricted for usage? Is that true? Um. No, well, the um, to ch just to take the um, example of the New York public, the footage that's in the New York Public Library. There's over a thousand hours of activist footage, and um, the the um, that anyone can can go to the um, the rare books reading room and, and look at that material, and w one can get a copy of that. But there's there's a kind of a process that one has to go through that. The, um, the person who owns the rights to the footage, that is the person who, um, who taped it, has to give permission for you to get a copy. And then if you're going to use it in a film, you have to get further permission to use it in, in the film. Um, that's complicated because a lot of this material was made by collectives. So in the case of testing the limits, there are six people who are members of the collective, and all six people have to um, agree to your getting getting copies and using it in your film. Um, it's perhaps even more complicated with Diva TV, where there are 12, 12 to forty members. Um, although that was a, um, a an affinity group of ACT UP, and they um, uh, yes. Um, an affinity group of ACT UP, and um, all of ACT UP's material is in the public domain, so one might argue that that is as well. But um, just to take, make it even more complicated, I take the example of, of Jean Carla Musto. Jean and I were once having a conversation, and she said that at any time she could go out and film as herself, as the audiovisual department of GMHC, as a member of Testing the Limits, as a member of Diva TV, and you know, I mean, wh where do you begin to sort that out? I mean, obviously, G Jean might would know what what she had in her mind <laughs> as, on any particular day, but you know, but um, but also, you know, she could film for any combination of those. So there there are all sorts of combinations, but the, um, I think that the material is. The, the great thing is that the material is, is being preserved and it's there for a thousand other movies. Right. It's a tremendous collection um, that you put together there and uh, what, what that's done is, is made it possible for people to access the, this footage, to look at it, to know, to, to, to bring themselves back to that time. And so, you know, congratulations to you for that. And I, I hope they can continue building the collection because there's so much footage that hasn't yet made it into it. David, um, what's your answer to that question? I don't remember the question. Uh, what was oh, the question? Oh, licensing footage? Um, uh, what's the question again? The question was... Um, no, that's not the question. Somehow someone has taken the question away from it. Was it. it was about licensing. Like no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Um, it, was, I, it was about the, um, the exclusivity. So you explained uh, how, how that gets done, and, um, and then for each of our films then, and for any film that would, would use this material, we would go then to the filmmakers to, to uh, ask them for permission to use it and to strike a deal with them, and that's certainly what I did in, in my film, and I know you did as well. And, and I think that anybody who might um, want to go back and look at that footage and try to tell any of the millions of other stories from that time uh, would find, I think, the encouragement of the filmmakers, as, as I did, um, to, um, you know, to, to take this and try to you know, make, form it into the, you know, some piece of history from this time so that other people might know about it. I have a question for the two of you. Why did each of you make the choice not to include background about the pre-ACT UP uh, people with AIDS empowerment movement um, as the one fund, uh, founded by Michael Callan and others. Sorry. 
um, before in, in 19, around 1983. Um, New York's New York uh, or New York's PWA coalition as well, um, without which ACT UP would not have been politically or structurally possible to form. Um, I just I couldn't do it. You know, I just couldn't fit it in. As you know, Jim said that that there could be a show a project about all of this. And um, you know, when I the first cut of my film was 13 hours long, just telling the story of these individuals that um, who's who I was following through that that uh, nine year period, and then you know, a, and you could you could almost there's so much footage and so much like incredible access from this footage that you could almost tell those years in in real time, like you could. <laughs> And, and I don't think many people would want to watch it in real time because that'd be like living it all over again. And um, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so, so I, I would love to see a movie about the PWA empowerment movement and um, and the important work that um, so many people did. The the uh, Denver principles that first established the, among people with AIDS that they had um, humanity and they had a voice in every decision that was being made about their their healthcare and their lives and um, that. That part of the history is uh, incredible, and it, it's, it's, you're correct, whoever wrote this question, that those are, those are the uh, building blocks on which ACT UP ultimately um, you know, erected its, its movement. Um, it, every film has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? And the middle of my film, which is the, which is the story of ACT UP, I think almost made itself, but it, the real problem was how, how do you get in, into the story and how do you get out of the story? And, and that was, they both were really difficult, and the, but the beginning especially, trying to figure out how, how much information people needed to understand and how much information could be put in. And, and um, Ali and I tried it half a dozen ways you know, some longer, some shorter, you know, like there was one point where we wanted to start, you know, just let in media race. And, um, and we came to this compromise which worked and it, it, it doesn't um, say anything about the, the movements that preceded, the, or the AIDS movements that preceded ACT UP. Um, but there's a, there's a practical problem that the, f that the footage doesn't really exist, that the, um, that movement, the AIDS activist video movement, to a large extent, begins with, with ACT UP. I mean, at Testing the Limits precedes it by a few months, but still, the, um, it just was so difficult that it's one of the many things that didn't get in, include, you know, Needle Exchange and Campaign 92 and Countdown 18 Months and a whole bunch of other things. So. There are a lot of films to be made, um, but which kind of leads us to this a couple of questions that are about now. Um, Frank Jump, Jump on Twitter asks, what can I do as an ordinary citizen living with AIDS since 1984 to support the decriminalization of HIV in the US and abroad? I think Frank knows the answer to that. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and many of us know Frank. Um, so thank you, Frank, for the question. Um, and, um, well, the first thing we have to do is talk about it. We've got to talk about the number of states that, that are imprisoning people with HIV who, f whose crime is not disclosing. Not the crime of transmitting, uh, but simply uh, the crime of not disclosing um, before having sexual encounters. And these are old laws and punitive laws that have almost no purpose today, even if they didn't have any purpose when they were first brought on the books. Um, if, if you have, if, if, you're, if you've, your HIV infection is undetectable, if you are uh, virtually non-infectious, if you use condoms and safe sex practices, it's still illegal in many states in this country to, to have sex without saying. So it's really no longer about, um, if it ever was, about prevention. It's, it's about punishment. And, um, and that has to change. And I know that there's a documentary on that subject in the works, and um, I eagerly look for it. Sean Strube is directing it. And, and, um, and that's gonna help us begin a conversation, I think, in a broader way about the problem and about um, how it has to be addressed. Unfortunately, it's a state-by-state -state problem and sometimes city-by-city, city, so it's a little harder to unknit those, those laws because um, you can't do it in one you know, national movement. 
Here is a question on a paper plate. PEPFAR claims AIDS free, an AIDS-free future. How can adv advocacy today keep the critical eye on the challenges, barriers to make this happen? AIDS-free generation. Um, this, these have been the, the buzzwords over the last year um, coming out of uh, Washington, um, uh, specifically coming out of the State Department. And um, uh, the, it's, it's built on the idea that if we treat people, if we treat everybody in the world with HIV, if we render their infections undetectable, we, we make them virtually uh, non-infectious. Um, and we can, that means we can end the epidemic. We can, we can end its spread. We can end the dying. It's all very cost effective. Medications um, in the developing world, um, uh, frontline AIDS drugs cost under a dollar a day. Um, and it would cost every year about eight to nine billion dollars to put everybody who needs HIV medications on drugs. Um, you know, my film is about how to survive a plague, but the truth is most people are not surviving the plague still because they don't have access to those pills. And, um, and eight or nine billion dollars isn't a lot of money. You know, Americans spent last October eight billion dollars on Halloween candy and disposable costumes for their kids. That, that, that's, that's the kind of figure that we're talking about. And what we lack right now is a political will to force our governments and our nonprofits and our charities to, to, uh, to step up and do that, to build the infrastructures in the world that allow those drugs to go out. PEPFAR is one of them. And PEPFAR is a bizarre um, product of the, Bush, the last Bush administration. By bizarre, I mean it's amazing. <laughs> At, from an administration that did nothing amazing. Um, and it, it um, st in a single stroke, brought um, the idea of the urgency of bringing medications to the developing world. And today there are eight million people on drugs around the world, thanks in part to PEPFAR still, to the Global Fund out of the UN, and to the efforts of uh, charities like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the... Um, the uh, uh, the Clinton initiative. And so um, it can be done. And you know what I got excited about as I was traveling around this past year with How to Survive a Plague was the, ac the activity taking place on college campuses, specifically around the Student Global AIDS Campaign, which is a, a group on campuses of young activists who are trying to find ways to force our government and our institutions to, to get the drugs out to the people who need them. And, um, and it's, it's exciting to think that there's activism going on at that level, um, and, it, and that's what it's going to take to, uh, to force these few billions of dollars every year um, out into the world. And once we do that, it could, you know, it could really, like, it could end transmission, and, and that, the idea that that's possible or uh, attainable um, is what this, this initiative was, was all about. The reason there was an AIDS crisis and the reason why there are 40 million people with HIV in this world is because the Reagan administration created a model of neglect. And that model has been followed for the past 30 years. And, um, you know, that just wishing that PEPFAR is going to um, solve the AIDS crisis is, is, is you know, just um, a foolish thought that what's going to force the government of the United States and of West, Western Europe to, to fund it and, and to end the AIDS crisis is gonna, only going to be political, um, po um, political action and people in the streets. And that, that's the only thing that has ever worked in the AIDS crisis. I have one more, I have, I have a, not one more question, but I have one, a question here for both of you. And it says, both of your movies look back in time. Um, but I'm wondering, what is, what's going on now with people who live through it? Um, what does it mean to survive? How did people cope? How do people cope now? It's a, it's a really powerful question. Um, and certainly, we not, neither of us addressed it and looking over our shoulders that way. Um, my film swings to it a bit at the end where um, uh, in an interview David Barr says, um, for a lot of people it was more tough after 96 uh, than it was before. Um, 
And we've seen that. We, we haven't seen much research about what the circumstances of survival are. Um, uh, what wounds have we carried forward from that time? And what has that done to us as individuals and as a community? Um, what, is, what is the cost of all that grief and terror that we lived through? And what is the cost of learning as we did that our government was, was um, you know, betraying us? Um, that, uh, you know, wh what, what do you do with all that? And how do you go forward? And I think after 96, uh, many of us looked forward and we said, we're, okay, that's, that's that, and now we're gonna try to find a life and try to, um, to, to live a, the ordinary life that we were fighting for the right to have. And, um, but we see that there are still these um, you know, long-term ramifications, not just for people who are living uh, with HIV from all those years ago, but for, uh, for all of us, I think. And you know, unfortunately, um, Spencer Cox, who was a, a central member of ACT UP um, and a long-term survivor himself, died this past December um, of AIDS, um, a reminder to us that you know, that AIDS still kills 18,000 people a year in the United States, and that there's a cost to, to having survived all of that, that it's not, you know, it's not, we're not out of the woods. And, um, uh, and I would love to see, you know, uh, and encourage people to go and try to def identify that and to look at it and, and help us understand, um, you know, what, what the burdens of this have been and continue to be. I, you know, I always feel very awkward when people ask questions about now, about, you know, about the contemporary situation, um, because I, I just feel completely inadequate to answer them. I, I mean, I'm a person who lives in 1987. I mean, there's a reason why I made the film that I made, is because, um, you know, that's, you know, in my internal world, that's, that's where I live. And so, um, you know, I want to encourage pe people to make more films, and there are other people who are far better qualified to make those films than, than I am. We're getting close to the end. I want to ask, there's one other question that I want to ask um, here that came from the audience. And is it true that no footage of trans people exists? How can this be true? Um, no, it's not literally true. There's just very little. Uh, I mean, I, the question of uh, um, why um, there there isn't a trans presence in my film has come up several times, and and the the truth of it is what that the dis the discussion was was very different then. The, the, that um, the um, dialogue around trans issues is very much more sophisticated and present in 2013 than it was in in the late 80s and early 90s and and in in retrospect it seems odd perhaps that it wasn't there there wasn't more of a discussion but but there wasn't and there's very little footage there there are there's there was at least one member of act up who was a trans person then and of course a number of people um, have transitioned since then but there, there, there wasn't the footage to, to tell that story for my film. Did you come up, was there footage that you came across? Uh, Jim and I were working with pretty much the same footage. Um. Um, oops. oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Talk to the world. <laughs> Talk to the world, not to, yeah, not down. Um, it's eight o'clock. This is, uh, is there one burning <laughs> question, comment in the room? Yes. I have a question, it's for David France, and I, it's genuinely a, 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 a curiosity I have. For those of us who were there back then, this is, has to do with the miniseries, um, I understand it's being scripted. Are the character, are our dead friends going to be named in the miniseries under their names? I mean, is Spencer Cox going to be Spencer Cox or Spencer Box and, you know, or what? And are their families or loved ones or survivors going to get any kind of cut of the profits? That's my question. Um, uh, it is so early. Um, but I'll tell you what I've done in, in my, my previous films. Um, I, 
uh, Our Fathers, for example, um, which I didn't make, uh, it was made from my book, um, I, in, I insisted that the, the producers of that film, and that was for Showtime Network, that they work with the people who, whose stories they wanted to tell and, um, and bring them on at, you know, to, to, uh, to participate um, in, in the, uh, the, the way that their stories are unfold and, um, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and begin a dialogue. And, and I've said the same thing to ABC about this. Um, I would prefer um, to give the individuals the, res the opportunity to have their names used in the film um, because I think what they did was historic and significant and deserves to be recognized and remembered. Um, and that's, I, I felt the same about the people whose stories, who, who were uh, uh, involved in um, breaking open the secrets and lies in the Catholic Church about sexual abuse, that they had the courage to, to demand attention to what happened to them. And I thought that they should be rewarded with, um, w with letting the world know what they did. And so that, that's, that's my philosophy in, in moving things from nonfiction to fiction. And, and, um, and that's the argument I'm making now. So uh, how that'll work out is going to be a part of a dialogue with, you know, involving everybody, I think. But it's, a, it's a certainly a fair question, and I think ethically a really important one when you move something into, um, into the area of a, a scripted you know, uh, a telling of a story of real people and real facts. Um, this was, oh. It's a prompt. It's a prompt. <laughs> Where's the microphone? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Tony, it's time to end. We, we got to go, Tony. Uh, okay. okay. I just want to say, I want to oh, thank, I yeah, okay. Oh, you, oh. Yes, to comment on <laughs> on this evening, on your any thoughts that you have after having had this conversation. Speak to the mic. Any <laughs> conversations <laughs> that you've had, any con any thoughts you have about this conversation, or things you want to say in general. Um, I I think I've said everything I want to say. I um, um, you know. Um, often when I show the film, I think that, you know, I've, I've had my say for 93 minutes on the screen. So um, I'm happy to let it stand as it is. So, um, But I do want to, I, I want to thank um, Ted Kerr and, and Tony. Um, um, and all the people who made this possible. So... Um, I, it was just uh, great to be here, so thanks a lot. I want to I wanna echo that. You know, um, as Tony knows, when I was um, finishing my edit on the film, I brought it here to Parsons and the New School to show in a series of feedback screenings with students to, um, to help me understand what people uh, in, in new generations did know and what they didn't know about what happened then and how, to, and, and how to make sure that the story was accessible to them. So I, I owe a lot for this story to, um, to, to Tony specifically and to the students and faculty here. Um, and I, so I'm glad to be back now to talk about the whole process a year later. So thank you. And I, I just want to thank the two of you. I thought... Um, uh, it was, would be a wonderful opportunity to have the two of you together to talk about these films. And I thought, yeah, I'd love to be the one on the stage with you to, uh, after 30 years or whatever this is. But, you know, the, uh, <laughs> but the thing that I actually think is um, that sort of sticks with me about the film is how much more there is to tell and what an amazing job the two of you have done to bring the and how lucky we are to have the two of these films present in the world at the same time because I think these discussions are really important. So thank you very, thank you. very much. Oh and outside when you're out when you're outside, please pick up flyers. There are two more days of programs that we have um, that are part of this series and um, we encourage you all to come back.